You! I have a proposition for you, slave. Who the hell are you? Just an old soldier. Here's the deal. You drop your gun, we have a duel. A duel? <laughs> Come again. You get to that gun before I get to my... this. You kill me, take her, fly away. Why should I do something that stupid? Soldier's honor. It's all you have left. Welcome to the Highlander Rewatch Podcast, where we discuss each and every episode of Highlander the series and movies in great detail. Uh, I'm one of your hosts. My name's Keith. I'm Kyle. Eamon. And today we are talking about Season 1, Episode 6, A Bad Day in Building A, which was first aired October 24th, 1992. It's directed by Jorge Montesi. Um, I believe he was the Chilean war refugee or something. Yeah. Uh, he, he's done some other episodes of Highlander. And this was written by Kevin Droney, um, who was the writer on Mortal Kombat, if oh. memory serves. I think we talked about that in a previous episode. And he's written a couple of these um, as well. And I think he also did Air Commander, Space Commander, one of those. Wing Commander? Wing Commander, mm, that movie. Very good. So anyway, uh, as far as guest stars go, we have... Andrew Divoff as Brian Slade. Um, he's been in a lot of different stuff. He was uh, most notably in Lost, I guess, fairly recently. Wishmaster. Wishmaster, yeah. Which he's, he's the uh, the main baddie in that. Is he the Wishmaster? I think he is. Yeah. I've never seen Wishmaster. Yeah, it's like it's a crazy movie. It's that's that movie's older than or newer than Highlander. I think it's mm-hmm. uh, it's basically like a. Aladdin sort of story, like a genie story, except the genie is evil. Ooh. And he's the evil genie. Um, yeah, and he's he always, the evil genie. He always crops up and stuff. He's almost always the bad guy, and he's always like a Russian dude. Yeah, I, I think he's got that like sort of facial structure. Well, not in this episode. He's from oh, <laughs> who knows? Where. Not Russia. <laughs> he's in Air Force One, and he's also in Mac and Me. Oh, Mac and Me. That's mm-hmm. a fantastic. Movie. <laughs> it's great. I recently watched that. Uh, oh, that's a good one. I Look, thought he kind of looked like Josh Hartnett, Andrew Divoff. Yeah. Like, Bore resemblance to him. <laughs> this show also has uh, Alf Humphreys as the janitor. Um, he comes back a few seasons later as a different character. Um, hmm. Actually, so does Andrew Divoff. Uh, he yeah. comes back later. Um, but he's in like First Blood, X Men Two. He's he's in, like he's got X Men United. Yeah, X X, X Two colon X Men United. Mm. Uh, he's in a lot of stuff. And then Andrea Libman is Belinda, who's the little girl. Uh, the janitor's daughter. Hmm. Um, she has a shit ton of acting credits, uh, mostly in cartoons. Uh, she yeah. has a lot of voice work, My Little Pony, and like a ton of Dragon Ball, like Dragon Ball, all the Dragon. Oh Ball wow, that's stuff. interesting. Who does she play in that? I don't remember. I don't have it in my notes, but she's in a lot of stuff. And then the other huh. really big one, the one I knew kind of the most, was Gary Jones is the lawyer, um, and he's this like great like background character in Stargate SG One. Uh, he's the guy that mans the the like the Stargate controls. Oh, who's like literally in every single he's, episode? Yeah, he's literally in every episode. Sometimes in the, it's, at least in the beginning episodes, he doesn't even have like, lines. But I think people picked up on the fact that like he's this great background character and he developed wow. like this weird mythology unto himself. That's pretty cool. Um, so anyway, uh, the episode description according to IMDb is: Duncan, Tessa, and Richie are held hostage at a courthouse by a convicted killer and his gang. That's it. That's the whole episode synopsis. <laughs> Also, the episode description on Hulu really betrayed what this episode was because it used the phrase, nobody dies harder than an immortal. No way. But as we will discuss in detail, this entire episode is just die hard in a courthouse. (laughs) So this episode opens with, we find out that Tess has, I guess, a funny habit of getting parking tickets. They're leaving... Their house, I guess, 
wherever. Yeah, this is like a new angle of the antique store. I guess it's like behind it or and something. It's just a wall covered in graffiti. I I, had, I took note of a couple of things. <laughs> <laughs> the wall said uh, one of the things is Vemptor, Zakto, and Yabo. <laughs> Yabo are, are all written what? on the uh, on the wall. I thought those were pretty funny. Yabo, Yabo, I'm Yabo. I'm sure those are all like real real bits of graffiti too. Um, so she gets all these tickets, and I guess it's revealed that they've got to go to the courthouse to pay, like, this insane tax stack of tickets that Tess has. And it's like a family trip. Everybody is going. Right. Yeah. Uh, so and Tess got a ticket as they were leaving. As they were leaving, she got another ticket. Uh, so they all leave to go to the courthouse. Tess yeah, is no. really upset. She's like, I pay my taxes. Like, yeah. I can't believe <laughs> I have all these tickets. It's like, yeah, taxes and tickets. Though they both begin with T, <laughs> are not the same. Um, so anyway, we cut to inside the the courthouse, and we see some like painters getting ready, like obviously nefarious painters. These are clearly wicked painters. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> like it's so apparent from the moment you see them, like their like their outfits. Something about like how grimy they look. They look untrustworthy. Yeah, like immediately, like instantly, you're like, okay, yeah, found the bad guys of this episode. Something else about this I wanted to bring up is like it shows the bailiff closing the courtroom door. The bailiff's mouth doesn't move, but somebody says, hey, Charlie. I didn't notice that. So it was like either the <laughs> crooks are saying hi to the bailiff, and the bailiff's name is Charlie, which if they're crooks infiltrating this place, why would they become friends with the bailiff? I guess just to... It was weird. I was That's like, weird. who's saying, hey, Charlie? Who's Charlie? <laughs> none, wait, none of the henchmen are named Charlie because he says all no. their names. <laughs> doesn't make any sense. We end up in this courtroom. So... so this is building A, presumably. So Presu presumably. presumably, so because just Tess to pause. and Richie go into this building to pay the ticket, which is on I forget what floor they say. They're like, oh, it's on this floor. Duncan stays in the car just to hang out, and so yeah, then we're in this building viewing this this court trial thing happen. Yep. Yeah, which apparently is like a closed proceeding, like. There's no one in the gallery, I assume because they didn't want to hire extras. But either way, the <laughs> the explanation that's provided to us is that this guy is so dangerous and his trial has become so controversial that they've apparently decided that they have to close the courtroom. Let's play the, a, a clip and take a listen to what happens in the courtroom uh, here in this episode. Is the defendant ready to receive sentence? We're not, Your Honor. I object to this entire proceeding. Noted. Anything to say before sentence is passed? Also noted. <laughs> Brian Slade, I hereby sentence you to the term of life without the possibility of parole for each of the seven counts of murder in the first degree. Terms to be served consecutively. Your Honor, defense would again argue that Mr. Slade's trial has been a mockery of the judicial system. Mr. Klein, your client has been convicted of one of the most heinous crimes in the history of this country. One which has left seven people dead. The man is so dangerous I had to sentence him in a closed court. We're going all the way on appeal, way over your head. Mr. Klein, that is your right. Take him away. Come on, Slade. Let's go. Okay. So, Kyle, spoiler alert, you're a lawyer. Uh, wh what what is happening in this scene? So, nothing. <laughs> in short, <laughs> nothing that's supposed to be happening. So, just the the fact when he says, "Does anyone have anything to say?" Like, there's a whole list of sentencing factors that are applied, and there's this whole process they're supposed to go through, especially when a person goes to trial. You'd think this man would have something to say on behalf of his client, who he knows is facing consecutive life sentences for apparently murdering seven people. And he just says nothing. And then he's like, this whole entire proceeding's been a mockery of justice. And it's like, maybe it's because you didn't say anything. <laughs> like, maybe it's because you didn't do your goddamn job that you mocked some justice. Also, I like that they say it's like the most heinous crime in the country's history. Don't say what it was. Yeah. Yeah. Well, we know what it left. It left seven people dead. So, like, I'm guessing it was a terrorist attack just based on the the fact that he's got this whole posse and it doesn't seem like he's part of some organized crime syndicate. Right. It's probably some kind of act of terrorism. All that being said, still, they this guy clearly went to trial. The prosecutors are there but do nothing. This entire proceeding takes about five seconds. Right. 
And then apparently this proceeding is so dangerous they had to close it to the public, but there's no public outside like waiting for the result. It's not like they had to actually lock anyone out. No one was there, <laughs> and then they locked no one out. <laughs> Like, there's not even press there, like, yeah. clamoring to hear the result of, not like, the, the crime of the century, apparently. Right. That is a great point. <laughs> <is> also, <laughs> just more thoughts on this. I guess there, at some point they reveal that there are two bailiffs in this courthouse. Only two. I don't know if they're supposed to be, like, sheriff's officers or what, like, if they're cops or what their job is. In any case, there's like this crime of the century going on, and no one thinks they need more security. They're just like, yeah, this one guy can handle the world's most dangerous man, and like the crowds that are apparently gathering that have to be excluded. Whole thing, the whole thing's applesauce. I don't know what's actually happening here. Meanwhile, Duncan's asleep during all of this. He yeah. fell asleep in the car. He's asleep yeah. in the car, which is played for laughs. It turns out those painters are as we thought. Oh, shocker. <laughs> Are, are nefarious and they're involved with uh, Slade here, uh, and so they break him out. Well, they don't get out yet, but they they break him. I don't know. Yeah. Which also side note, most courthouses when they're set when they're sentencing, especially when they're sentencing dangerous people, they have like a lift in them that connects them to some kind of county jail or facility. Uh. At least like most urban courthouses have that and i don't know how big seacouver is supposed to be <laughs> like i guess that's a, a hanging question but normally you would not take someone through a public goddamn hallway right who is a, a criminal of any stripe <laughs> let alone a master who's, criminal yeah let alone someone who's so dangerous you had to shut your courthouse it's like yeah this is so dangerous the public's not admitted let's walk him out through the public though yeah so the painters can deal with him <laughs> so the painters uh attempt to free him they start shooting up some people. Uh, yep. One of those people they shoot, we, we come to know his name. Uh, let's play this clip right now because it's amazing. Uh, so that the the, uh, the cops are in hot pursuit. Uh, Jerry! <laughs> <laughs> so they shoot Jerry. And Jerry, Jerry! And Jerry, in response to automatic gunfire, is running up the steps alone, unarmed. <laughs> and... Again, Jerry is one of the two bailiffs Jerry! in Building A, I guess. Which also, this must be the least auspicious courthouse that it's only called Building A. Like yeah. it's not called the Seacouver Hall of Justice, or like it's not <laughs> named after an auspicious human. It's just Building A because they wanted a title that. Rhymed. Well, when they pull up, there's just a big sign, and it just says I just realized Courthouse. It Really? Because that's literally the only reason <laughs> it's I, called I, Building A. I didn't realize that the title rhymed. Oh, I even boy. have notes about how stupid the title is. <laughs> well, it is that. I guess that sounds better than A Bad Day in the Seacouver Hall of Justice, <laughs> named after like the mayor that died 20 years ago. Right. So Richie hears the gunfire, and he tries to escape with Tess, and they yeah. get captured by the goons. Um, right. But not before Richie meets... Some old guy? Some old guy that I guess he has some connection to from his, like, shady past. And he's like, For no reason. Yes. This man has nothing to do in this episode. He's there, like, he gets a lot of screen time, like, to no avail. Yep. <laughs> also, he doesn't recognize Richie at first. Then he puts his glasses on and goes, Rich, Richie Ryan! Uh <laughs> <laughs> So uh, one one thing I had noted here, which we'll notice as the episode kind of moves forward, is this is like maybe the ugliest episode of Highlander that's been filmed. I think it all looks pretty grainy. Or do you mean in terms of like the cinematography? Both, both. I think so. I I did some some digging, and this building that they're filming at is actually the BC Institute of Technology. Uh, so it's like a it's a real location. They use the exteriors and interiors as far as far as I could tell. Um, and as far as like TV and filmmaking goes, like that's I don't want to say a no no, but usually not the case. Like if you have an exterior of a building, use the exterior, and then you find a suitable interior building to do interior shots. So this is all just one big office building, and it shows because there are like no windows in this place. Everything is very boring looking. Like it's all just a bunch of hallways and tiny offices. Uh, so as a result, the lighting is low. The lighting is like yellow. 
light yeah. because I don't think they could get too much real lighting in there because I think they have to use like just the fluorescent lights, like that the are gross there. yellow fluorescent yeah, lights. Yeah, um, and then to try to make it interesting, there's a bunch of like Dutch angles, which is like when you basically just tilt the camera like 45 degrees. Right. Um, Batman sixty six fans will be very familiar. Yeah. Uh, so it's just it's a really clunky episode uh, because of the darkness of it. They have to use like a different film grade, so it's like it's grainy because it's dark. Like this episode doesn't even look. Like very nice, I don't think. I don't no. know. So I didn't note about that just because I was like, this episode is ugly, and the story is ugly too. <laughs> <laughs> well, right. one one thing we 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 glossed over that I wanted to bring up too was the the janitor with his kid. Oh, oh yeah, we yeah, did yeah. skip that. Like so, this before the the trial starts, a, a janitor is bringing his daughter into the courthouse, and he's like, "Okay, wait here while I'm at work because your mom's at a job interview." And he, like, leaves her unattended in a closet full of toxic chemicals and dangerous equipment. But and also, toys. But also, and like, toys. toys. And toys. Like, he's clearly yeah. done this many times. <laughs> yeah. Like, the, she's got her own little setup. Like, she's yeah. having a tea party with all her dolls and not... Six feet away are like these big bins of like bleach, like cleaning <laughs> fluid. Like they, they have tea that's made the teas for turpentine. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but that's that's gonna come up later. Yeah. The uh, criminal slate. He takes over the court courthouse. It's essentially. Slate. To... Slate. Yeah, because I thought it was it's... Slade with the D. I thought it was Brian Slate. I have Slade with a D. Oh, God. All the names are so similar. We've got Slan. We've got... <laughs> I know. Uh, so he essentially takes over the courthouse, and I think they, they say later that the whole reason he's like held up there is because of that copy shot. They make a weird reference later to being like, yeah. the bailiff stopped us or something, and so like they couldn't make the escape they wanted to, which I'm not sure why, because they blew the guy away. I think yeah. the, the bailiffs managed to alert the authorities, uh, so they couldn't like quietly slip away. That makes sense. Like The bailiffs alerted other police officers. Okay. So anyway, Slade and his gang are effectively under siege in this courthouse, and then we get to meet some of the other players in this story, which are... Randy McFarland, she's outside doing a newscast. Mm -hmm. Another one of our favorite Highlander characters. Ugh. And then Commissioner Kaminsky shows up. Right. Which, do they bill him as a commissioner at this point? No. Uh, in, this, really, in this, he's a lieutenant. He said yeah. lieutenant he got down, he Kaminsky. Got... So in my head, I'm like, hold on. So he blew the, the fucking Felicia case from last week. And so they got demoted. demoted. The mayor fired him? I don't know. I don't know. Well, here's the thing. In, in, in free fall... He's just Commissioner Kaminsky. Right. In this episode, he introduces himself. Like this, I feel like this was his first appearance, and they just rearranged the order of the episodes. And then in the meantime, he got promoted. Yeah. Because <laughs> also, I guess this episode sort of maybe explains why they know him. Yeah. Well, I mean, like, that would Kaminsky, make sense. Kaminsky. But, hey. but at the end of this episode, he also seems to know McLeod. We can get into that later. Yeah, he does seem to. I think he recognizes McLeod when he yeah. sees him on the security feed. Also, his name is Stosh Kaminsky. Yeah, which the number of times hearing <laughs> this guy, Brian Slate or Slade, say, try to say Stosh or Starsh or. Stosh. <laughs> <laughs> the whole time I was thinking of like Stan Darsh <laughs> like from <laughs> South Park. <laughs> So, yeah, he's the hostage negotiator. Also, he has this, like, Irish SWAT captain that he's dealing with. Yeah, so that's another point of contention in the episode. Like, those those two, the lieutenant and the SWAT captain, are kind it's, of having it out. Like, what's the best way to deal with this? Yeah. Yeah, to go in or do this other thing. And I get that the idea was to give Duncan all the time in the world to solve this problem because that's, you know, the point of the show. But there are multiple points where it seems like, okay, yeah, now this now's the time to go in. And then they randomly call it off. Like, they're in agreement. Like, yeah, let's go get these guys. And then, for no reason, like, ah, I quit. Yeah. We end up seeing, so, Richie's friend Stanley, this is another, like, I'm big on, like, plot structure in these shows, if you couldn't tell from last episode. Um, one odd thing that happens in this episode, so, Richie's friend that he meets, they're, they're now both hostages. His name is Stanley. Uh, and Stanley's like hyperventilating and he's like taking pills. Right. And like clearly Stanley's like an older guy now. Like there may be one Richie knew him when he was younger. Uh, it's revealed that Stanley's like a con artist or used to be. He, he in fact introduces himself this way, like any good con artist. <laughs> he's like, oh, yes, ma'am. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a confidence man. <laughs> like, uh, so anyway, 
structurally in this episode, I don't understand the point of this character because it doesn't there is, there is not because it doesn't pay off at all. Like in a in a good TV show, Highlander will be good soon. Just hang in there, guys. In a good show, Stanley's medical issues would come into play, right? And be there would be like t- t- time is ticking. Essentially, like I was expecting Stanley to have like a heart attack or something, right. and it's like we need to get him out of here. He needs an ambulance, like, or else he'll die. So, like, not only is the clock ticking on everybody, but like, even if Duncan saves them, like, he has to save them quicker because Stanley's gonna die. Right. None of that shit happens. Stanley nope. just takes pills, and he's like, oh, "I can't take this anymore. <laughs> I'm an old man." And it's like, okay, and then nothing comes of it. And it's like, why is this character here? Yeah. So Stanley should have had a heart attack or something in this episode to raise the stakes. And Stanley does not raise the stakes. Well, the same thing can be said for both the lawyer being there and the janitor. Like, they serve no purpose either. The janitor just every once in a while goes, Oh, my daughter! <laughs> <laughs> and that's like the entire role that he plays. He's like, oh, I should tell him about my daughter. Oh, no, I shouldn't. <laughs> and, this and then same thing with the lawyer. The lawyer's just like, uh, I'm the smarmy lawyer guy because it's fun to do that on TV. And then also accomplishes nothing. Back in the courtroom, everyone's been taken hostage. Duncan has come in to save the day. He heard the gunshots. He runs in. He gets captured, too. Uh, so then he ends up kind of sacrificing himself to save the blood-sucking lawyer Who's like, oh, like I have kids or whatever. Well, Duncan comes up with that lie. Right. Like they're gonna they're gonna axe the lawyer, and Duncan's like, oh, don't kill him. He has kids. He told me. And then I guess maybe they kill him anyway. It's unclear. Yeah. It, well, he says take him and put him on ice. They they t- put him on ice means kill him, right? I think so. Do th- we see him again in the episode? I I'm don't pretty remember. sure he's not in the episode after this. Like two goons take him away, and he's done for the episode. It's a little unclear. So Duncan's sacrifice may have been in complete vain. Yeah. But then the bad guy takes him into a room with the only working security camera, which I guess the police have a feed into, and they cut away before they execute him. And it looks like all the cops looked away, too, because, like, they're looking in a different direction. And then it comes back, and he's dead. And they're all like, <gasps> <laughs> And there's no blood. Yeah. Yeah, zero. But presumably, blood. they shoot him in the back of the head. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's like if, it's ex- if it's an execution. So anyway, Duncan dies. Lieutenant Stash. <laughs> Starsh. Starsh. And the SWAT captain are always arguing about, like, we should, like, neg- Stash wants to negotiate. Yeah. Lieutenant, or the uh, captain wants to... Like, just go in and get as many people out as they can alive. It's great because Lieutenant Stosh is like, where do you think you are, Beirut? Uh, they have this great argument. Um, and they had this same argument, like, six times. Oh, yeah. yeah. It was like they read the argument once from the script, and they're like, now can you, like, riff on that, like, six <laughs> times? Like, yeah. give me, like, a theme and variations on this. Well, then later he mentions Munich, like, the the Olympic That's right. hostage situation. <laughs> yeah. And I'm just like, oh, boy. <laughs> yeah, which also, for taking over an entire courthouse, they have a shockingly small number of hostages. Right, because they only have the people who happen to be in that room. But like, what about all the other random people who are there to be? Yeah, I mean, Tess, sentenced... Tess was there for traffic court. And right. Yeah. So like, there's traf- got to be a line of people there for traffic. Yeah, court. traffic court is usually a madhouse. <laughs> like, I don't know if they've got like municipal court there and like a bunch of people there for like summary offenses. But this place should be jumping. What is happening again? Unless C. Coover is actually contrary to what we think, like a sleepy little town with a courthouse of six people there's one clip i wanted to play so after the the argument between stash and swat captain uh we cut back to randy mcfarland and she has like she's being very frustrated by this whole story and like just her whole job she has the strangest monologue i've ever heard it's i'd i'd, I'd want to just summarize it by reading it but it's like it's, it's a, out there it's really out there it's a bunch of half thoughts non-complete sentences so we'll just play this and uh, it's nuts all the news, all the time. You are there. In sports, one dead, no man on, no score at the top of the seventh. Update, any city, any time. Some poor fool just died. Film at 11. This is great. This is like, I don't know, is this... This are we witnessing like a fever dream? 
from like Randy. It's like, really weird. Like, I, also, she's got top billing on this show. She's in the opening credits. At yeah, this she's point. now in the opening credits. Yeah. So, like, it's just because I'm in the credits, I need something to do. I think that's part of it, technically. I think, like, there's union rules about that sort of stuff. Yeah, no I, I don't know. <laughs> it's weird. But, but it's very puzzling, and she again really doesn't add anything to this episode. Nope. nope. <laughs> uh, like, inc- especially not that bizarre dialogue that she just shared. Like bottom of the ninth, Such a garbage. Also, yes. when she she asks the cameraman to get her a live feed, and she says, "I don't care what you have to do, this, that, or sell your children." <laughs> but she hands him a tape. Yeah. When this happens. Also, it can't be a live feed because it's already on tape. Already on tape. And also, uh, I guess, is there a bigger news story going on in C. Cooper than giant hostage situation at the courthouse that the news is like, I don't think we need to like cover this yeah, live, yeah. right? This yeah. isn't for us. No. Also, somewhere in this, I guess, Rich, so back inside the courthouse, the at least the hostage takers think that Duncan is dead. But Richie and Tess know better. And I guess the bad guy is like a little bit smitten with Tess and like wants to talk to her about the dead Duncan. He goes up to like, you know, speak to her and Richie tries to jump in and defend her and like kind of just slaps him lightly (laughs) on the arm. And says like, you stay away from her. But like the motion he does and his (laughs) overall body language, it's like he's saying like, Stop it, silly. (laughs) It's really absurd. Richie is not good at intimidating people. (laughs) And he's always trying. Like, not just in this episode. Like, every episode we've talked about, like, he tries to intimidate Devereaux in Threefall. Yeah. He tries to intimidate all the guys in the episode with Kim Sung into giving him information because he's so scary. He's the patron (laughs) saint of tough guys. Like, he's just... They're always trying to get us to buy into. Well, I guess it's consistent, at least. Like in every episode, like Richie's like too big for his britches, so to speak. Like he's like Scrappy Doo. <laughs> he, he literally is Scrappy Doo because they're both very annoying. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, Duncan ends up. He's he he gets shot. Everyone thinks he's dead. Of course, now he's got the upper hand because he can like move throughout the building. No one suspects that he's around. That's right. Uh, so this is where it really becomes. Like die hard. Die hard. Like, so right. he just sneaks around the building and just starts offing all of Slade's goon. And the first guy he gets even I think resembles one of the characters from Die Hard. Like, yeah. He's this tall blonde haired Yeah, he's a Swedish nerd. Yeah. It, yeah. it looks exactly, exactly like, like yeah. the guy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it was insane. Uh, so I have the clip of how Duncan murders this guy. Now this is an interesting test of your reflexes. Can you turn and fire that thing before I skew you? Good news is I'm rusty. I might miss. You want to know what the bad news is? <laughs> bad news is I'm really pissed. <laughs> not even a joke. It's not even a burn. Very witty. But he says it like it's like, like the... Like a good one-liner. Yeah, like it's the exclamation point at the end of this episode. So Duncan stabs this guy with like a weird... This like, is, yeah, this is like a little, this is after, so he finds the little girl in his wanderings around this courthouse, McLean style, and he sees this like sharp stick. Yeah, it's like something you pick up with, tra- it looks like a, it looks like a golf putter. Yeah. But clearly with like a sharpened end. Yeah, that's exactly what uh, it So like. it's for picking up like trash and stuff. Yeah. So he uses it like a sword and just stabs people. Hmm? Yeah, including one guy, this thing is sharp enough to cut through the door of, like, a bathroom. Like, those hardened Yeah, like a stall door. Stall door, yeah. So the next and guy he gets, it's through the bathroom stall, and he, like, pins him to the wall. Like, yeah, with this, with thing. this thing. It's like, how is it this sharp? Even your sword might not be able to do what you just said. Yeah, uh, so one thing I want to comment on this, when I saw the bathroom murder, I was kind of struck by, like, the grotesqueness of the whole thing. I was like, this is really gruesome. Uh, I, I think this is so far the most violent episode of Highlander. Like, I don't remember there being much blood in Highlander up until this point. Like, when they shoot Jerry the cop, Jerry! Uh, like, <laughs> there's a big blood splatter. Like, it's really, like, intense. And it, like, remains on the wall for the re- yeah. remainder of the episode. Yeah, so I don't remember any other episodes being this violent uh and then obviously duncan is just like stabbing people left and right he's literally like slaughtering his way through this building also like, he's on a rampage I, i'll bring this up now but i was i was going to mention it l- like at the end of the episode this is the first time duncan has killed mortals 
Right. And so I think that's uh, we, we talked about that. I think in the the road not taken is that like oh like is it fair for Duncan to f- even fight like mortals? Like I mean he takes yeah. out a lot of people. Like he spares Chu Lin and he even spares um, Kim Sung. No, uh, um, in the last episode, he, he spared uh, Chu Lin and Kim Sung, but he spares yeah. Joan Jett in the right. last episode. Yeah. But these guys, nope. No, it's like it's a bloodbath. This is a really intense episode, and maybe he, that has to do with Duncan. Duncan's a little mopey at the end of the episode. Yeah, he even spares the the lynch mob in uh, Innocent Man. That's true. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, this is I think the bloodiest and most gruesome episode of Highlander we've seen. Yeah, and it's also a thing like just trying to think of what kind of hero Duncan is. Like, who is he? What's his way? We're sitting here wondering. Up until this point, I thought he was a fundamentally nonviolent person, and if ever there was an option, even a choice, like people wouldn't die, including immortals, apparently, because Felicia's a baby murderer, and (laughs) he let her live. Like, Kim Sung (laughs) is a slaver of humans, and he let him live. So, like, the, the, the floor is very high for who he will let live. But these guys, like these goons, like he has seemingly no mercy for. So I'm kind of curious going forward what exactly he will come down on cuz yeah. I'm not necess- I don't think he's like out of line like I don't think it's a bad thing that he no. kills these guys. No. no. But at the same time it's like okay like are we dealing with more of like an anti-hero like I think I kept thinking of like Mal Reynolds from Firefly like how he kills people like that seems like the kind of hero he is in this episode like right. oh okay I'm just going to murder these guys. Yeah. As opposed to... Yeah, his moral barometer hasn't really been set yet by the writers, I guess. So he's making his way through all these thugs, and eventually the little girl says, oh, I can show you a place to hide that'll be really good that nobody knows about. So it's like a secret hallway to the judge's chambers. And then Duncan brings her in there, and he's like, hey, you have to hide in here. And she keeps on saying, well, I will, but you have to tell me a story. Yeah, so the story he tells her is, I guess, interesting. It's a very... Like, autobiographical story, you could say? Maybe. I'm very <laughs> curious to the extent to which we should consider this autobiographical. Right. We should... Yeah, let's listen let's to it. Let's take we'll a listen. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, once there was this place where the fairy people lived. It was a beautiful city in those days, surrounded by white walls and tall stone towers. What were they like? Well, they were like regular people, except they lived for very long time and they never grew old like peter pan yeah sort of well the fairies were handsome and wise and very very clever just like duncan was as time went on there were more and more people and soon the fairy people had to leave their home in the fairy city they moved into the mountains and into the old forests, and in the caves, and in the cliffs. But the other people always found these places. So the fairy people had to move on. That's sad. Where do they live now? Oh, Belinda. They're all around us. And you know what their job is? It's to protect children. And sometimes tell them stories. Have you ever met one? Oh, lots. You stay very quiet in here now, okay? Hi. So I I think that's a pretty cool story. It starts out kind of whimsical, and then as Duncan's telling it, you can tell it's kind of like he's telling his story. Right. So the point I was very curious about in this is the city portion of this. Yeah. Because by this point, Highlander 2 is out, right? Oh, yeah. His second movie has already come out. And in that movie, they introduce this premise that, ugh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that immortals are basically aliens. Wait, what? <laughs> from another world. So is that what he's referencing in this city component? That, like, these fairies all used to live together. They were all Whoa. on the same team, but then they were forced out. Because that's part of the plot that, like, the immortals that were sent to Earth were, like, banished Hmm. there by their peers. That's interesting. So is that what he's... Is that, like, a reference to that? Like, at this point, are we still wed to that mythology? I don't know. Or is this just this, like, whimsical story? 
and he's just referencing the fact that when you're immortal, you have to keep moving on because you live forever, so you really can't stay in one place. That's how I read time. it, but I you're kind of blowing my mind with this this Highlander two interpretation of it. I'm just just wondering at this point because. It's also, out there, and we're not sure what the relationship between the movies and the show is at this point. Yeah, uh, also, I should make a point of clarification for all the listeners. If you haven't seen the movies or anything, that bomb that Kyle just dropped on everybody, uh, you can kind of disregard that. Like, don't think that in the future, Dun- Dun- Duncan McLeod is not an alien or anything like <laughs> that. Like, that, that, that point is, is not adopted by this show, or even the movies. It's abandoned very quickly, and it's like the strangest thing ever. It uh, is. It's bizarre, but we're not sure what its role is no, at this it. point in the evolution of this mythos. And and as far as I know, this is 1992. They are in the middle of filming Highlander three at this point, which does like backtrack on all that Highlander two stuff. Hmm. Uh, so I mean, I think for the the movie producers, they've they've realized that that was a big mistake, and they've already kind of nixed that idea. So yeah, I I don't know if I could interpret that that way, but that's like an amazing way to think about this. I'm just I'm just not sure at this point. And I ultimately think that wisely both the movies and the show move away from that origin story. Yeah. But that's one way of interpreting what this fairy story is. Awesome. Uh everyone on like Facebook and all that stuff, you definitely need to email us about what you think about that yeah. interpretation of this cuz that's amazing. I'm uh, holding off on watching Highlander 2 until we cover it. So. I cannot wait till we get yeah. to that. Uh, so, yeah, we'll be uh, also just a future forecast for the show. We will be talking about Highlander, the movie, in between seasons one and two of the series. Highlander 2 is going to come between seasons two and three. So between every series season, we're going to do a movie along with some other stuff. So anyway... Wow, man, Kyle, you just fucking blew my mind with all that. Back in the courtroom, Richie is trying to psych out the the hostage takers by trying to convince them, I guess, as like kind of a callback to his con man friend who's with him, that the other sentencing that was going on in this building, there happened to be two serial killers or mass murderers being sentenced to that day. Right. And the other one was some kind of Hannibal Lecter-style cannibal murderer. So the way he's able to get into their head was by getting that they were killed with a sword because he knows that, like, Duncan would probably have some kind of stabbing weapon. Which is really weird. Do, do, do they mention that one of their cohorts was stabbed or something? They don't, but I think that's why they're freaked out and believe his story. Right. That there's, like, this serial killer, because he seems to have this, like, notion that they're going to be stabbed. And then Richie comes in and goes, like, <laughs> <laughs> to do, like, this crazy impression of this guy eating their friends. <laughs> and I guess he also posits it as an explanation for what happens to Duncan's body, right? That if there was a cannibal, the uh, cannibal uh, would steal it. Duncan's yeah. body for grub. Oh, I, I did want to mention something I did really like about this episode. Well, Slate's a pretty creepy guy. I yeah. Think. Uh, so th- him and uh, Tess have a good interaction because Slate keeps hitting on her. Mm. And he's like, you're some woman. And Tess is like, you're garbage. <laughs> <laughs> you're fucking garbage. Uh, but then they cut to a shot of Slade. Slade gets up on the, uh, like, in the judge's chair. I yeah. thought this was great. And he's got, like, a broken phone. Right. And it's this huge Dutch angle. Uh, and Slade is just, like, there's no soundtrack or anything. And he's just, like, slamming the broken phone down like a gavel. Yeah. And I thought that was great. Like, that seems something, like, the Joker would do or something in a Batman comic. Yeah, uh, it's pretty uh, pretty, pretty out there. I thought that was, was I thought that was cool. In, a, in an episode that was full of, like, not great moments, I thought that was, like, a, at least, like, had some flair to it. And I was I like, think ooh. Like, that would have been a great moment in a different episode. In an episode that's more about, like, whatever... There's no question in this episode that he murders these people. Right. Right? Like, there's never a specter raised that this guy could be innocent or that there's been some kind of miscarriage of justice or that he's anything other than a murderer. Right. But in some episode where, like, it's actually about, like, some kind of kangaroo court or, like, messed up proceeding... Like, that would be a little more poignant. Yeah. That maybe you've got, like, some damaged person doing this... Right, but who's actually maybe not in it, maybe not guilty of the crimes he's right. accused of. Hmm. But I agree, it's a cool shot. Yeah, yeah. And, and and speaking of other cool shots, so at this point in the episode, everything starts coming to a head. Like Duncan has taken out basically all this guy's goons. Slade has requested a chopper, 
so he landed on the roof so he could make his like escape to the to the great north woods. The, right. That's what the SWAT guy says, which I thought was also interesting because in our next episode, Mountain Man, that takes place in the great north woods. Ah, so, so I thought that was like another kind of interesting some like setup, some wait, continuity. Wait, this was kind of yeah, which I, is also set up like the SWAT guys like we'll never find him there. Right. And in Mountain Man, it's like Duncan has a hard time tracking people in the great north woods cuz it's such a precarious set of terrain. Oh, world building. Yep, world building indeed. Uh, so anyway, so all this stuff co- starts coming to a head, and the ch- the chopper's coming, and they did this. I thought it was a really great shot. There's the sound effects of the chopper going, and the camera starts spinning around Slade, and then you hear all the voices on the radio. Yeah. And it's like all the police like chatter. Uh, I thought it was a really cool shot used to great effect because it's like things are kind of spiraling out of control, like what's going on in Slade's head. There's all this like just noise happening. I thought that was mm-hmm. a really cool. Yeah. Uh, moment. So anyway, uh, Slade takes Tess. He's going to yep. flee, but then he runs into Duncan. And Eamon, what happens when he runs into Duncan? So uh, Duncan is sitting at the desk, and he has, like, a machine gun, and he presents Slade with a with a dual option. So yeah, he can either go for the gun before Duncan stabs him with, as he says, this. Because he doesn't, he doesn't even know what that yeah. the trash picker upper thing is called. Uh, and Slade rightfully is like, why would I do that? Right. And he's like, soldier's honor? And he's yeah. like, oh yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. That doesn't make any sense. This guy's a murderer. And then Slade just takes him up on it. Yeah. Yeah, for no reason. He has no incentive to do this. Yeah. So Duncan bests him at this this duel. Yep. And stabs him. Of course, it wouldn't matter even if he didn't, because he wouldn't get killed by the machine gun. Yeah. I guess the only the, the big threat is that Tess would be then still kidnapped and taken away, and she might die. Right. But yeah, the stakes aren't too high, I guess, for Duncan. No. Um, and so that kind of like concludes the like the the conflict of the episodes. Then it's all like a denouement after that. Yeah. Well, it's it's <laughs> the the wrap up's really weird. Um, Duncan <laughs> brings the daughter to her dad in the courtroom. Uh huh. And then he's like, "Oh, I owe you big time," and. Duncan says, whoa, maybe you can help me. Then it cuts to outside, and all the hostages are leaving. And this is where Duncan sneaks away. He's wearing, like, the janitor's outfit and a Malcolm X hat. I guess. That's what I was trying to piece that together, too. Is is that what the favor was, that the janitor lent him his clothes? But he's not really sneaking away because then the Lieutenant Kaminsky, like, addresses Duncan. Right? Yeah. And is like... Oh, like you escaped. It turns out, or like it turns out that Duncan wasn't real. Like I don't understand. It seems like Duncan he's... didn't need to sneak away because he was already like identified. Well, and also it seems like Kaminsky is covering the fact that I mean, a hostage was shot, and it seems like Kaminsky's in on it. Like he's <laughs> like, no, the the hostage is okay. The, the the hostage is okay. Nobody was killed. Yeah, it's like a fake. Like it's like he's covering something up. Maybe this is how he gets promoted <laughs> to commissioner. <laughs> That's what I was thinking. Because he convinces yeah. them that he dissolved this hostage situation with no one being killed. Right. Even though Duncan was like presumably shot in the back of the head. <laughs> and and they, we don't know what happened to the lawyer. They also cover up the fact that a, a third party killed all these terrorists. They say that they all turned on one another. Yeah. Which I guess is an okay working theory if you have no reason to think there is an outside party. Right. And there's, I guess, no one left alive to tell you <laughs> otherwise, so... Or is the favor Duncan was asking for is that everybody keep his involvement in this quiet? Does everyone else even know? Mm. I don't know. I don't know. Except either. for Richie and Tess. Like, none of these... Well, they all the, saw My him... daughter guy and the old man never yeah. see anything. I mean, they, they, saw, they all saw him get taken out of the room, so presumably they all thought he was taken out to be killed, and then they see him back. I don't know. It's weird. Do they see him back, though? I don't think that the the other hostages see him again. I can't remember. Fuck. Fuck <laughs> this episode. I have, all right, so I have this written at the, well, so Duncan leaves. So Tess and Richie get in the car, and they're like, all right, like, we're going to leave. And he's like, I, ne- I need some, like, alone time. Right. And so they leave, and then Duncan just kind of wanders, like, up the stairs and away. And he looks really sad. And he's, like, super sad, and he looks at the camera, and it's like, 
It's just sad, and then that's the episode. Why is he so rattled by this? That was my th- thought with thinking that is this the first time he's, or at least in the context of this show, like killed a bunch of mortals? Like, is this right. like weighing heavily on him that like he just killed like a ton of people? Well, in a, in a just world, he does feel bad about that. I mean, <laughs> right. I know they're bad guys, but like you feel bad when you kill them. Yeah, you kill sure. the people. I mean, I guess that has to be in, right? I Let's guess it has to be because there's no other justification I'm, present in the episode for like why he would be sad. Yeah, but he's he's pretty rattled by this. Like the end of the episode is just a close up of his sad face. <laughs> So yeah, that's basically the whole episode. Uh, and just to close out, there's a little behind-the-scenes stuff on this, in which D- Duncan's like limping around most of the episode, like he's like, uh, well, obviously he's been shot in the back of the head. Uh, but it turns out that when he was initially killed or like dragged out of the the courtroom by the one thug, uh, he hurt his like back or leg. Oh, but uh, so he's like legitimately limping around the episode, which ends up kind of working in the episode. But yeah, uh, that's kind of why he's sluggish. I had this thought while I was watching it, and then it was confirmed by an interview with the producer. So this is what's called a bottle show. Uh, these are like – everyone I think will be familiar with like sitcoms do this frequently, and mm-hmm. it typically is toward the end of a production's run where like the money – like things like episodes have gone over budget, so now they're left with like a small budget for the last like two or three episodes. So they do an episode that is like completely self-contained. That's where you get like the, the sitcom trope of like – Oh, we're stuck in an elevator for a half an hour. Like, let's Uh, just talk. Like, because they're super low budget episodes. So that's what this episode is. Although I was kind of a toss up with that. I was like, it does seem kind of like a big episode. I mean, there's like a a helicopter. It's a helicopter. Yeah. It doesn't seem like it's that small of an episode. Yeah. Um, And so um, Bill Panzer, one of the producers, says that the studio cut their production time from seven days to six days. And that's why they made this episode. I don't Hmm. know if that's. One day difference doesn't seem like it produces this episode to yeah. me, at least. I don't know if that seems well. Maybe legit. if they were just unprepared for the switch, that's also another maybe. thing. Like maybe they could do a different thing in six days, but if they weren't ready to, if they had to all of a sudden redo their shooting schedule, yeah, that that could be a big effect. Maybe. Um, and then one thing I found uh, this is the first time we've kind of read a a review of a show. Uh, on this episode uh I've, I've tried to find reviews of other episodes but honestly the reviews on like amazon or imdb are almost incoherent in, in, wow. their, in their in their verbiage uh and prose like it is i i can't even read them on air uh but this one i just wanted to read because it's amazing at least two stars i'm tempted to edge towards three because this is the first season one episode i actually liked uh, <laughs> uh, who wrote that i don't know uh but if this is the first episode you like in this Ooh, series, boy. ay ay ay, like this is one of the this episode isn't good. And if you think the previous five episodes are worse than this, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I mean this is middling. This is not the worst episode. No, it's I think Freefall, even though it has like more immortally stuff, is full of more just like yeah, it's bad a mess. writing and th- I, like this is at least a little bit self-contained and it like. I guess it makes sense within its own context, but I don't think this is like a good episode. Like, no, it doesn't make it just chuck it out. It doesn't make any sense. Like. Yep. So is this a great episode of Highlander or is it the greatest episode <laughs> of Highlander? It's the greatest it's one. Great. One missed opportunity <laughs> is that they don't say McLeod like Gruber says McLean in <laughs> Die Hard. I think that's a missed opportunity. Yeah. Any final thoughts on this, Kyle? Um, I mean, I'm more upset that there was no Yippie Kaye related lines from Duncan, but I guess he's really not that kind of hero. I no. guess not. This episode is, I guess, in its own taken on its own terms, is reasonably entertaining. I think that the villain, at least, is equal to some of the villains we've seen in yeah. his kind of over the topness, and that I think is not bad. Hmm. Um, I'd agree. So you know, if you've got some time, watch this episode. Certainly listen to us talk about this episode. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, and again, the past two episodes have been like, we are in the dread, like the dredges of the, this show, like right now. Like, it only gets better. It only gets better. And I cannot wait till we get like, what, another six episodes in the down? And this show starts to really take off. And I feel bad that we're like ragging on this a lot. All right. So, uh, 
thanks for listening, everybody. Uh, hanging on with these these episodes. Uh, make sure to uh, follow us on Twitter at the Rewatchers. Uh, like us on Facebook and subscribe to us on iTunes and Stitcher. Um, also, if you want to contribute to the podcast and have your comments read on air, uh, send us an email um, at Highlander Rewatched at Gmail dot com. Also, make sure to follow Eamon um, and check out his awesome art and especially his awesome Highlander art. It's Eamon B. Doc uh, on Instagram, and that's E A M O N B D O C uh, at uh, on Instagram. Uh, check that out. Uh, you can follow me at Doctor Hot Dog on Twitter and Instagram. And that's about it for this show. Join us next week when we discuss Mountain Man, episode number seven. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Take care. I mean, they also, a lot of these people he murders with a child present. <laughs> In one of those, she's like literally hiding. <laughs> Get your act together, man. I thought it was funny. It was funny. <laughs> it was a good line. <laughs>